You wait, have you turned it on? Yep, we're recording now. Okay. All right, so why don't we start with the library. That's one of uh, the topics we've got here. And Sid, where do you have specifically addressed, or would that be something more obvious than I know about? Well, I just remember going to the, the library when Charlotte Wright was the librarian, and uh, uh, I thought you could talk a little about Her. the way it was set up and how Charlotte did stuff. You might have talked about Charlotte before, though. I don't know if that was in the last interview. Well, why don't we talk first about the library is located in the uh, Douglas Academy building. It was. Okay. It, was it, For was a lot first, of years. Was that the first place the library was ever in town? Well, I don't know that for a fact, but that's what I surmised all the years. I assumed that was the case because the money was for building the Daniels Academy was supposed to do something for the library. And at the time that they built it, I think they had a pretty good collection of books. And they never threw a book away. And Charlotte had been the librarian for a long time. And she was a, wit a, 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 a neighbor of mine. Okay. And she was good friends with me and did lots of babysitting for my children when they were growing up. And she visited in my house almost every single day. And if she, she came in the house and she saw dishes in the sink, she washed them. That was the kind of neighbor she was. She was a wonderful neighbor and wonderful help with my children. And she loved the, her job with the library. It was the only job she had ever had. And she wasn't particularly well trained or educated, but she really wanted to share the library's books with everybody. And she walked all over town because she didn't have a car. So she, everywhere she went, she would always take books to people that she thought they would like. And she got on their door and and ask them would they like to borrow this book or that book or, and she'd pick up other books and so she was out in the community talking to people all the time about books and that was her passion so she was it turned i i thought it, she was very affected by doing that because so many people who might not have bothered to come to the library were like to have her drop in and and bring books that she thought were good and she was pretty good at picking them out too and and she would encourage you to borrow books from the state library if they didn't have the books on hand that you wanted and she'd go the extra mile all the time to try to get uh, people reading books and helping them find the books they wanted to read and would enjoy. So it was kind of a nice, friendly library that was not just limited to the library building. And I guess that kind of appealed to me too. And she often got people talking about books because of that. but. It was just something she, she liked people and she liked to get them reading and she liked to help them get the books they wanted to read. And it, uh, that, that's where the library should be. Do you, do you know if she was the one who, be, who began the caretakership? Uh, or this was the time, this was the person that was involved during your earliest interactions in town when you moved in in 48, I would imagine, right? The, she was already the librarian when I moved here. And she had been for long before that. I don't know how much, how long before that, but when I was a little girl and I came up, we would go down to the library and there was Charlotte. She was always there. I don't ever remember a time when she wasn't the librarian. 
Well, what happened to uh, between the time that they closed that library in the town hall and the new library where it is now? Was it in another place or? No, it they moved directly from the. They did. I think, I don't. I I don't have a specific yeah. remember memory about that. So, but I never remember it being anywhere else. No. And I remember all the negotiations we went through to turn the get the library, the the church when it was the Methodist church turned over to the town, and then the, I was very involved with the negotiations that turned over the building that they had just gotten from the from the church into the town library. So I think that they moved directly once they got it. That's my impression. But I wouldn't rely entirely on my memory on that. Now what was Charlotte's last name? Charlotte Wright. And her son Rodney Wright was the postmaster for the town for most of the my early years here, and he was a and he was the same way. He wanted to be sure letters got delivered. He take them home and give them to you at at, at home sometimes, and, <coughs> and we did a lot of shipping by mail of some of the products that we made in home manufacturing. And he was always very helpful in processing our mail. And it was very hard for me to get used to the new postal service when they took over from him and he was no longer just the postmaster and the old fashioned way of doing things. Uh, didn't it never seem to me nearly as helpful as he, 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 if something came in and he knew I, wa I was waiting for it, he'd either come, my sa come himself and leave somebody else to watch the library, or, or he would uh, give me a call and I could go over and get it. It was always super, super service from those folks. They, uh, the, way, the name Wright would have been W-R-I-G-H-T? Correct. Um, so the library was maintained at Daniel's Academy, and the, the transition over to the Methodist Church, you don't have a, a, a good recollection of the transition from, from those two locations at this point, is that right? That's correct. Okay. But I'm pretty sure that it, I do have a recollection of, uh, of being participating in the uh, whole process by which the church gave, sold the Methodist Church building to the town of Brookline, because I think I was on the Board of Selectmen at the time that happened, and, uh, and how they refurbished the, the church to turn it into a library was a important thing. Mitch Chandler and Phil Chandler had a lot to do with clearing the title for the church building to be able to sell it in the first place to the town. We had to find the heirs and uh, who had given the church building to the church and who had specified it was for church purposes and go through the courts to get it cleared that it could be transferred to the town and the town could use it for other purposes than, than a church. And that took a lot of work. I, I didn't participate directly in the actual work of doing all that, title searching, but Midge and Phil Chandler yeah. found the heir, one of the heirs, the only one that was left living, for, that had given the Methodist Church land to, to the Methodist Church in setting that up. 
and they uh, uh, they were able to get this air to do what was necessary to make that all those transactions possible and that was quite a triumph in my judgment she they they worked terrifically hard doing that and without their dedicated perseverance i don't think it would have happened yeah. and it's nice to have that building for a church a town library oh, is phil chandler is he a real estate or lawyer or something else or He's retired now, and he has a house down in South Brooklyn, but I think he's living mostly in Boston. But his son, Ben Chandler, lives down there, right near their family home. Yeah, he's up on the hill, I believe. Yeah. yeah. And he he's very knowledgeable about all of that stuff. He could tell you more if you who, wanted who was, to What was Phil's uh, occupation? Phil was an engineer with BAE Systems okay. when it was Sanders Associates. Yeah. He was a, he's a very uh, highly trained engineer, I think. Um, and then once the once the the library was moved to its current location, which is the Methodist Church. Um, do you remember how much of that building was occupied at the beginning of, of things? Because they expanded upstairs later on. No, I think they they took the whole thing over at the at once, but they didn't finish the upstairs until after they had moved quite a few of the library books into the downstairs yeah. and started using it downstairs. They had a lot of space, and I think they could store a lot of books there too, and. I'm trying to remember if there was a, a transition place where they stored books for a while too. It was a big job moving out of the town hall, and they had a big collection for the town of the size that it is. And like I said, they never threw a book away. Did books normally come from donations or? How did they arrive at the library initially? Well, there was a, usually a, don't, a, a budget item in the town budget to buy books and to pay for the cost of the library. And the library trustees administered the funds that the, ter the town turned over to them for the use of the library. So that the library had a lot of independence from the direction of the Board of Selectmen, but they were worked closely in connection with them and the budget. And that not, it still happens that the library trustees come to the Finance Committee hearings and, and tell what books they plan to buy and how much they plan to spend and request funds from the town. And then they also had other sources of income from people who just like to give money to the library. And they had the Friends of the Library, where they, which has always been quite an active organization and has done a lot of things for the library over the years and got a huge boost when the library moved out of the town hall and they suddenly had room enough to do a lot of the things that they hadn't had any room to do before. So it was really a, a big step forward to move into that building. And they take reason, taken reasonably good care of the building with the help of the town. And so their stewardship of the library was greatly improved when they moved into the separate building. And then they had parking and stuff that they didn't have before. So uh, I, I think it was a, a great move for the library and a great move for the town. And it was also a great move for the church yeah. because they were trying to maintain two buildings and they didn't have a congregation big enough to use two buildings. Did any other follow-up you want on the library? Um, no, I don't think so. Okay. 
Um, let's go with a soapbox derby. Okay. Topic. Well, maybe she can tell you some, some more about it, but I think it was, again, my husband's idea to do one, have a soapbox derby, and they would close off the uh, Meeting House Hill from the top up by where the her, her historical society is, and they would have races down the hill, and they had rules for what the the uh, contestants could do with the uh, with their wagons to fit, dress them up to be uh, enter the soapbox derby, and they. They uh, painted them up, and they fancied them up, and they tried to make them run faster and and better, and and they practiced to see if they could be the fastest one to run, race it down the hill, and so they had a lot of fun in the days leading up to the race itself, and then in the race itself, everybody lined all sides, both sides of the hill and watch the kids racing down the hill. And it was, it, it was an exciting race. They, they, one would pass the other and everybody was cheering. And, and I remember it as being a highlight of, when did we yeah, do it? Yeah, different age groups, didn't they? Yes, we had a lot of different age groups. But it was a summer activity or, or something? I was like trying that. to think what the time of year we did it. I tend to think it was maybe the spring. Yeah. But were these are wagons or were they home built or could they be anything? They could be or, anything. Yeah. Anything you could put wheels on and make something out of. And Sid, Sid and, and my sons all spent a lot of time building their. Uh, they're super duper racers and getting ball bearing wheels and all that kind of thing, and they, and then practicing driving so that they didn't tip, tip <laughs> yeah. the whole thing over, and I. Well, we used to have a thing that looked like a bobsled, kind of all made out of wood, and um, I remember dragging it down to the store and back to get groceries in it all the time. Was that for the soapbox derby we built that? I'm not remembering that very well. We, we had... Uh, I, don't, I just remembered that thing. Maybe, maybe you can ask Ted and yeah. Tom. And, and the soapbox derby took place for a number of years. Yeah, I it don't know how... Decade. I think it was probably in the 50s, maybe, or early 60s. Yeah. Probably the late 50s, I would say. And were there awards given out? Were there... Oh, yeah, yeah. there were prizes and all, everything. I wish I could remember what time of year. And there were a lot of, a lot of the current people around, like Morris Marshall and Buddy Doherty and those guys that liked to race in the soapbox derby too. Dale Ward. Yeah. Uh, Dale will remember. Dale liked doing that. And we have some old family movies of some of those soapbox derbies. Do you really? Yes, yeah. we, we do. We should get a hold of those and transfer those to video. We have a lot of movies of the, the Winter Carnival too. And the skating and the skiing and stuff. That'd be great. Yeah. Uh, do you remember, ever remember any of the uh, kids who would have won? Well, I think my kids all had took one time or another, but I don't think I remember any specific other kids that did. Dale Ward, I think, was very active in that. I bet he won. I just wouldn't remember which yeah. ones won. Yeah. I might remember more of the ones that... I think liked. parents got involved a lot and helped build the, the carts and stuff. Yeah. Of course, they yeah. were to race. Right. 
Yeah. That's neat. Clarence, I remember. Parents, I said, yeah. You said Clarence. Parents, I said. Oh, parents. Yeah. Well, Clarence was always in on getting the road ready and all of that kind of yeah. stuff. Was, it, was the road not uh, uh, sanded? I'm sorry, was it not paved? It was, it was paved, oh, and what? it was, it was fast. It was yeah. a fast track, and the kids get going pretty fast, and we had some pretty good crack ups on several occasions. Let me hear about those. Tell me that. I don't know. You don't know about the crack ups? I don't know who had them. But what would happen? I mean, they they come down the hill, obviously. They come into. Well, they'd have to swerve around a. a, a uh, when they were overtaking, and they yeah. and they swing the the handle around, and it would become unbalanced, and off they would go. Uh, that's you know, always have the best steering characteristics on them. On those wagons, Two would get tangled up together and stuff like that. Occasion, that yeah. one occasionally one would run into the back end of the other. Uh, where was the finish line? Was it for, was it beyond at Bond the Bond Street? at Bond Street? Yeah. And so they had to obviously stop sometime thereafter. Yes. Uh, I imagine some of the crack ups may have occurred even at that point. Right. Well, I I think they were usually were parents at the bottom trying to slow them down when they finally went over the finish line, if I remember right. Yeah. And. But there were some good bruises that different ones got at different times. But they used to have, and we used to have some little girls that liked to do it too. Uh, who was it? Was it Emily Kroll or one of those kids? That always. The, the, the girls always mixed it up with the boys with just about all those town things. They were tough girls. Tell me about the haunted house. Well, this place, the this house was the haunted house. This was the haunted house. And it was a summer place, I think I told you that. And uh, uh, Sid and, and some of the other youth fellowship leaders would put up wet sponges and and things draping from the ceiling that they had to thread their way through and okay. and ghosts popping out of corners and everything it was a uh, we did it for Halloween for quite a few years didn't we I don't remember that so much I think that you must have been a little before my time the kids, when we did it, they, the ones that did it really loved it. They, they had a great time. This house was just empty for a number of years, and you used to have parties up here and all kinds of events. So was this kind of the uh, official, unofficial town haunted house during its time? Well, I think that a lot of the kids walked up past this house headed up to the stone house okay. and they always kind of looked at it because it was empty and looked kind of kind of uh spooky and and uh, i think some of them probably actually sneaked to peek inside and explored a little bit around it and they used to talk about it as the haunted house this brings to mind when uh, Dad did the arsenic and old lace. Oh the yeah, you have you done anything about and everything? the way off Broadway players? Yeah. Have you got that on your list? Uh, actually, I don't, but I remember that uh, uh, happening in town in the late nineties. Well, that was a that was plays that went on at the town hall. Right. And uh, they went on over the years. The it was a long the tradition way. of them. Yeah. Miriam Jepson always was in the plays. And, and Sid's father My was father. always in the plays. Yeah. They both li loved to do the drama stuff, and they were good at it. And they did some really awfully funny setups.
but my father made uh, this, for one of the plays, he made a thunder sheet, which is, he just took a huge long piece of um, sheet metal and yeah. hung it from the ceiling. I don't know if it's still there, but it was there for years and years backstage from the, at the town hall and, and you could rattle it different ways and you could bang it and it sounded just like thunder. Yeah. And then he created a rain machine by putting BBs into a, on top of a turntable inside of a cookie tin oh. and amplified it. So when, <laughs> when the BBs spun around inside there, it sounded like, it really sounded like rain. And he used to do a lot of the sound effects for these. He loved to do the sound effects for the plays. Never mind loving to act in them at different times. He was, he was really into that kind of stuff, and the kids loved it. He got so involved. They call that type of person a Foley artist. Foley? Foley, F-O-L-E-Y. -E -L -L -E oh. If you look at movies, you'll see a Foley artist, are the ones that create the... Like if someone's walking in a, in the in the uh, woods, well, they can't mm -hmm. necessarily capture that live, so they'll put that in afterward, and they'll they'll create that whole sound underlying. Yeah, the, he was the, the Foley artist, yeah. but it was live. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> pretty yeah. neat. That's pretty neat. Um, well, let's talk. About, so the haunted house was here. Was there was there an official uh, Halloween attraction or Halloween event that occurred here during that period? You mentioned. Well, that, the haunted house always did its thing on Halloween, and usually I think we invited most of the kids who wanted to come to come. They had to walk all the way up here. You got a friend. I guess I do. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so this is something that your family did. Well. It was mostly our family that did it, but it was mostly the youth fellowship groups that participated, and other kids too, so that there are probably a lot of children outside our family who remember going through the haunted house. And some of the stuff they did, cooked up was really scary, and they were scared. I can remember that. That's the whole point of it, right? But it was a tradition for maybe five or ten years while Sid and the same group of kids wanted to do it every year, and then I guess they got out of doing it after a while. So, Sid, were you part of the the creation of that, or some of the actors? No, I, I don't really remember the haunted house that much. I think oh. it must have been just before I was probably too young or something. Okay. Probably didn't let me go to it. Well, a lot of the youth group work was done before my daughter Mary was even born. Uh, and by the time she came along, we were into other things, so. But the youth group was a church thing, and uh, it went on for many, many years, and they had junior youth fellowship and senior youth fellowship, and they did lots of activities. It was very, very active, and a lot of young people in town were always involved in it. So it was kind of the main entertainment for. Well, and that's where we out. fixed up the youth, the Methodist Church, for all those activities to happen. So they had tournaments and basketball games and all of those kinds of things, but they also had social events that the kids put on that they were interested in, dances and, yeah. and all kinds of things like that, and games that they played. So the, the church building, well, I would say probably for 10 or 15 years at least, was the center of all of the extracurricular activities around town. And all the kids participated, not just church kids, if they wanted to. Yeah. Now, those activities occurred while the church was still a church, not after it had converted to the library, right? Well, the library came after. That's what I think, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. After they were no longer 
the church really got to a stage and the ch kids got to a stage where they weren't using it as much anymore. One reason was because the school built a gym and they could do their basketball at the school and they no longer wanted to do all those sports activities at the old Methodist church building so that had been converted. The old Methodist church yep. was all was basically a gym. It had basketball hoops in it. It was all one big open space. Now the downstairs you're speaking of is the main level because no, yeah, the there, there's no level. foundation to that. Is a slab, I think, or not? Uh, I, I don't know, but they, there was a badminton court in there for many years. We used to go play badminton, but there was basketball and uh, all the dances, and they had lockers in the little front room where you could keep your stuff. So it was a very active youth center. And we had a lot of different uh, guys who had sports that they liked to introduce the, the young people to and put on in, in there. There was something on Wednesday afternoon and something else on Thursday afternoon and something else another afternoon. And so it was hopping all the time with all those activities. But when the gym came along at the school, then all, a lot of that stuff got transferred to the school facility and the kids would just stay after school and do those things. So the church was not, uh, building was not as utilized as it had been and the church was spending money to maintain it and they weren't g having enough use of it. And they decided it was time that they sold it to the town. And that was a big deal to get it sold to the town. It took, it took the responsibility away from a church group that didn't have the funds to maintain it and gave it to the town who didn't have a facility for, to use. And, the, and when the church, town finally got it, they realized that they needed it most for a library. And then they made the decision to put some real money into it and make it a real library, which was a good decision, I think. It has been, served the town well to have that, all that library activity separate. And they were able to fix the rooms upstairs to have uh, additional space for books and also meeting room. And they have a nice meeting room in the library now. And and I think that still gets used a lot for library purposes, but they do classes in there and all kinds of interesting things. So the, it was a good move to for both the town and the church to do that, and both buildings got maintained better right. as a result. Uh, do you want to segue over to the town band? Yeah, there was a guy in town who was very interested in a marching band. He said, I have to go to the bathroom right now, so I've got to be excused for a minute. I've got to take this off.